Hey there, this is Andrew. I hope you're doing well. This week we're going to be taking a look at creating a persistent scene loader for Unity's XR Toolkit. And what this persistent loader is going to let us do is have a scene that always exists for the player to sit in, where we can hopefully alleviate any stuttering that may happen when there's a scene change. We're also able to have functionality within our persistent scene to have some sort of animation or something cool like that while we're loading in between our main scenes. And in this video, it's primarily going to be an explanation of how and why I put all this together. And then the next video, we'll just be writing out the scene loader script because there's a lot of very small scripts that are involved with this project, a lot of them just for the effect. So sit back, relax, I'll do it all of the talking and then we'll do some typing in the next video. So hopefully that sounds good. So the bulk of the project you'll be able to find at a GitHub link down below. And while you're downloading that, I'm going to do my Patreon shoutouts for the most recent month. And I'd first like to thank Jacquees Jobert, Eric Patrix, Savan Ati, Adrian Soto, Pierre Franson, Soul Harvesting, Premerswall, Desarius, Hans Hummelgard, Todd Andler, Joel Diaz, Nicholas Marichel, and Andreas Brillen. I'd then like to thank Cubic Casau, Frederick H., Darren Swords, Keith Bradner, Brian Stevenson, Stefan, Ian Eklov, Travis Viertag, Dustin Millett, Chauncey Friend, David Fufu, B., Mark Paul, Max Ellinger, Mike Murray, Space Leviathan, it's a pretty dope name. Maxim Levy, Ho Yol Jian, John Anthony, Joa Chim, Luke Simmons, Veronica Flint, William Yara, Chromie, Marcel C, Christopher Bradford, Todd K, Thomas Charles Hartvig, and James McGill. That was a really long list. All right, so hopefully your internet was fast enough to download the project now and open it up. And when you do, you'll get something that looks like this. Now, there's a lot of little things going on here, so I'm going to try and explain it the best I can. And the first thing you notice if you look over here in the hierarchy is that we have two scenes open. We have our persistent scene as well as our menu. And our persistent scene is going to be holding all of the systems that we want to keep in between scenes. So naturally, you have the scene loader. We have our XR interaction manager, an extra script called our build loader that's specifically for our build, and we'll talk about that more later, as well as our XR rig. And we're using a persistent scene because it's a lot easier to handle multiple objects that you don't want to destroy on load. So we can basically have this simple container for all these little objects that we always know are going to exist. However, this is a more complex thing, so it does take a little bit of extra work to get working. And on that same note, this does take a lot of supporting systems to sort of get working because there are some sort of gotchas with dealing with this sort of setup with not only the XR toolkit, but trying to have cross scene references between scenes. And an example of that is if we're in our main scene here, we can't simply click and drag things into public fields that are in our persistent scene. We just can't do that. So we would need to refer to things via static properties or singletons or set it up once our project starts. So I guess a quick disclaimer is this may not work for your project. Hopefully there are maybe pieces of code that you can use from this in your own project in a much more simplified form. But you'll notice here that our persistent scene here is bolded, and that's meaning that it is the active scene. And this is done to imitate the build order that you would get when you build the project out. If we go to File really quick, go to our Build Settings, we'll notice that our persistent scene is the first one that's going to be loaded. And this is because this build loader script is going to be responsible for loading the menu scene once we get into the build. And this is because once we load that menu scene, it'll automatically become our active scene. Now, what is an active scene exactly? It's essentially the scene that if you instantiate any objects, that's the scene that they're going to be instantiated into. So think of the active scene more or less as the gameplay scene. And that's what's very important when you're dealing with multiple scenes, is knowing which one is the active one. And to switch between scenes, I created this little drop down here. And this scene drop down will let us either go to our menu or our game scene. And if we click on our game scene right here, we'll notice that we still have our persistent scene, and now we have our game scene. Note that the persistent scene is still bolded here. And this is done with just a simple editor script here where we just have a couple of menu items. And it's pretty simple. Anytime we click it, it's just going to either, well, it's going to open our persistent scene in single mode, and then it's going to load whatever scene we want in an additive mode. And this order is very specific, so it'll make sure our persistent scene is the active one. Now, one thing I haven't talked about is why that's important. And that's because when we're in editor, our active scene is more or less going to get loaded first. And that's very important for having our interaction manager ready for all of the interactables within the scene. But let's actually go back to our menu scene here and let's just hit play. And you'll notice that if we look at our persistent scene again, it's no longer bold. And now our menu scene is set to the active one. And that's exactly what we want. 
So what we're trying to ultimately do here in editor that's done when we're in our build is we have our persistent first and then we have our menu scene or our main scene that's going to be set as the active one. Now this is being done within the scene loader itself. Whenever we load a new scene, it's going to set that one as the active one. So hopefully that clears that up. Let's actually start to sort of deconstruct more things that are in our hierarchy right now. If we look at our scene loader here, it's actually quite simple. We're going to have a couple of events as a reference to a screen fader. You're not going to see this right now because that script is more or less going to be empty. I just need it as of right now to make sure that everything's working as intended. But what this is going to do is hook up to our indicator here to show and to hide it when our loading begins and when it ends. And this cube is pretty simple. It just has a simple rotation script on it, a little indicator script, and an animator. I guess we should go and we should look at some of the scripts now. Where that indicator script, it's actually quite simple. It just gets the animator, and then it has a couple of functions for showing and hiding the cube itself. As well as setting the animator, that's going to expand and shrink it. And that's just a pretty simple thing. We have a couple of animations as well as an animator here. And that's all pretty simple, so we won't have to look into that much more. We've already looked at that editor script, but what we can do now is go to our XR rig. Well, actually, before we do that, let's look at our build loader, which again, this is a very simple script, or the object just has that build loader script on it. And if we click on that, as soon as our project starts, if we're not in the editor, we're going to load our menu scene right here, and we're going to load it additively. So like I said, we're going to load into that persistent scene first to make sure it's the first one. And then we're going to load our menu scene after that, which then gets set as the active one. And to reiterate the fact why we're going through that is to make sure that the connections between the XR interaction manager and interactables within the scene take place. Because that's one of the little hoops or little gotchas that we're going to have to jump through, which kind of made this project a little bit difficult to sort of figure out. If we didn't have to deal with the, some of that hookup stuff, it wouldn't be that big of an issue. But doing it in this specific order is a lot more elegant than having to hook everything up manually, which we would have to get all the interactables in the scene and then give them the new interaction manager. But that's actually it for the build loader. If we actually get to our XR rig now, we expand it a little bit. You'll notice that we have this persistent camera here. Now what we're doing for that fade effect, well, this is pretty simple. Where on our main camera, we just have a screen fader here. We'll probably actually look at that script a little bit more closely in Visual Studio since it's probably the most in-depth one that's already been written. But we also have this persistent camera. So what we're doing here is we're essentially camera stacking using the camera depth, where we have a depth of one in our persistent camera and a depth of zero on our main camera. So what we're doing here is we're rendering everything on our persistent camera after the fade on our main camera. So this lets us display the pink cube as well as our hands while we're sort of loading in between scenes if we want to. And the visibility of the hands is actually done using this layer switcher here, where it's going to hook up to those events on our scene loader, and it's going to change the layer of our hands when we begin loading and when we end loading. Naturally, we can't have it rendered by our persistent camera all the time, or it'll never get rendered behind other objects within our scene. And this is just a little extra thing that I put in since when I shared a GIF on Patreon, someone had asked about it, so I decided I would throw it in here. And that's sort of the big anatomy of the project. We do have a few smaller scripts here, one that's just called button object that gets the singleton of our scene loader and loads the game scene. And that's just on this little sphere here. That's an XR simple interactable. And when we select it using our pointer, it's just going to load into our game scene. We also have this rotate script, which is just on that indicator, this little cube here, which just rotates over time. It's really simple. And then we just have this singleton sort of subclass where I just decided to throw this in here. Naturally, we could have something a lot simpler, but again, just wanted to include this as well. Now, before we look at that screen fader script, let's look at our prefabs. So we just have one for that scene loader, which is pretty simple, but we also have some for the hands, which these are just simple spheres and we have that layer switcher on it where our target layer is just going to be the persistent layer, which I kind of glazed over a little bit. So we'll take a look at that some more. Where I did talk about that camera depth, but I didn't talk about the layers. Where you'll see on our main camera here, if we go to our culling mask, it's set, currently set to mixed because it's going to render everything but what's on the persistent layer. While if we go to our persistent camera, it's only going to be rendering things on the persistent layer. And this makes sure that 
one obviously we're not rendering the same object twice but we can get some weird effects when we do actually render something twice so to reiterate what this does our main camera is pretty much going to render everything as usual and the persistent camera is specifically for rendering things that are going to be on top of our screen fade and you can kind of see a pretty good example here where all we're actually seeing is our pink cube here and everything's black around it because naturally the only object that that camera can see right now is the cube that's on that persistent layer which if we actually go and click on it you'll see that it's currently set to the persistent layer so that's what that layer switch is going to do is it's going to change it from whatever layer it's currently on to the persistent script then moving it back so hopefully that all makes sense now I think we've pretty much exhausted everything to talk about, so let's look at our screen fader script. Alright, now here we are within our screen fader script, where we're able to control the speed, the intensity, and the color of our fade essentially. And that's pretty much all being done on on render image here. And this is just a specific function that if you have a script on the camera that you can use. And all this is really doing is we're getting the texture from our camera, we get to apply any effects or anything we want to it, and then we're going to be outputting it to this destination render texture. Now there's a lot of videos on this for doing shaders and screen space effects and people that know a lot more than I do. So if you want to learn more about that, just look up post processing or on render image. There's a lot, lot of resources out there for that. But anytime we're going to be rendering our image, we want to check our intensity value as well as our color value. And we're just going to be doing that by accessing our fade material and setting the float or the color on it. And then we just use this fancy function, graphics.blit, to apply our fade material to the render texture that we're getting. So that's how we're achieving the fade. And then to actually call it, we're just going to be using these functions here, where I have these two public functions that all they're going to do is call a coroutine on this object. Now, usually when I have coroutines, I usually have the private with some sort of just public accessor. So we can ensure that the coroutine is going to be running on this behavior. But the actual fade in, fade out, it's actually, it's really simple. It's just a while loop. So really fancy, I know. But that's actually it for the screen fader. Let's go back into Unity and see if there's anything else that I missed. All right, and I think that's a pretty good intro for everything. In the next video, we're going to be writing out our entire scene loader in one go. Feel free to leave a comment below. I'll answer it there. But if I think it's something that more people may find valuable, I'll make sure to mention it in the next video. But I think that's all for me. I'll see you in the next one.